So information architecture is technically defined as the structural design of shared information environments, the art and science of organizing and labeling websites, intranets, online communities, and software to support usability and findability. So like most technical fields, information architecture tends to overcomplicate simple concepts. A better definition is this, connecting people to the content they're looking for. So where might we see an example of this in our everyday lives? One example is that one terrible remote control for that one crappy DVD player that you have hiding in your house. And you know the one I'm talking about, you probably want it at your uh, company's Christmas party. It doesn't work unless you stand right in front of the, of the player. And worst of all, the buttons make no sense. Like this one that I have at my place, where's the play button and where's the pause? Why is there so much space given to the number buttons that I'll never use? And why is the most prominent button the eject button? It has every function that you could ever need, but it's impossible to find what you're looking for. And what this remote lacks is proper information architecture. Contrast that uh, to this remote control, and as soon as you get your hands on it, it feels uh, a lot more intuitive. And why is that? It's using tools like grouping, color, hierarchy, and shape to help convey the meaning and importance of these buttons. It's still complex, and it can still accomplish a lot, but it's way easier to use. And this is what a well-designed information architecture will do for your HMI. And once, you, and once you start to think about it, you realize that information architecture is all around us. It's a, it's a driving force behind things like roadway signage, every website you've ever visited, instructions on prescription medication bottles, exhibits at museums, ballot and, and voter information guides, every book you've ever read, and even presentations like this one. So we ask ourselves, what do these things all have in common? They're all used for wayfinding in one way or another. Information architecture helps us to navigate through complexity. It helps us to make our, our interfaces intuitive and easy to control. An interface with solid information architecture should help to convey to us where we are, what we found, what's around us, what to expect, and where to go. So think of our design like you would a street sign. What can you do to limit frustrations and confusion? So in our years of designing interfaces, Ray and I have um, learned one thing about users. They never do what they're supposed to do. They click everything, they rarely follow instructions, and they never read. All that to say that a tailored navigational structure is going to be much more successful than what, something more generic. We want to mold our project to our users and not the other way around. So the three major questions that you should ask yourself are, who is this project for? Are there multiple audiences? and what are their needs? The understanding we gain from answering these questions forms the basis of the navigational system that we're trying to build. To help us keep track of uh, what we're building and who we're building for, we like to use personas. Now, personas are an archetypical representation of a user type. As we gather input from future users of our system, we'll include information about each person's role, their work environment, and their goals or needs to flesh out the persona. So for example, after interviewing a couple of fermentation operators, we've built a persona for Zach. So it's important to note that while Zach may not be an actual person, he represents a real general audience for our project. Later, when we're building out our screens, we'll be able to look back to a persona and say, will it work for Zach? Going through Zach's persona uh, here, we note his role as a brewery fermentation operator. His environment is the brew house floor. There are HMIs on the machinery. It can be noisy, messy, and he's probably wearing gloves. Uh, he cares about checking fermentation tank temperatures, being alerted to any problems and know how to respond and see tank levels and other details. And also having the ability to stop and start fermentation runs. As you interview different groups of users, you'll start to build out the other personas. Here we have three full personas that we've defined, and they each represent a different group of users uh, who will each have different needs. And you know they don't have to look just like this. Ray and I both come from visual design backgrounds, so we like to make things look pretty. Your personas can be as simple as a Word doc or a sticky note. The point is, each persona we generate will use the system in a unique way. So you need to be sure our project has the content which allows them each of them to solve their problems and a way to get to those uh, to that content. So this brings us to user stories. 
uh, we'll use this process to begin teasing out actual content for our project. If you aren't familiar with Agile, uh, user stories are a process we use to build functions with a particular user in mind. The format of the user story is simple. It reads as follows. As a blank, I want blank, so that blank. This is very important for us because we want to keep the user in mind as we build out our navigation. For our purposes, we'll fill out the blanks with user, content, and goals. So for example, as a fermentation operator, I want a view of the tanks so that I can observe their status. The result of this process are all the bits and pieces of functionality that, that will form your interface. Um, and as a side note, we could really go into so much more detail about uh, creating personas and user story creation. If you want to learn more about uh, all of this, check out a session that uh, I did at last year's Ignition Community Conference. Uh, we'll include a link to it in our post webinar email. So as you begin defining your interface, you start collecting a ton of different pages and functionalities. How do you make sense of, of them? One reliable way is through a process called card sorting. It involves listing out your functionality using literal physical cards or stickies and getting together with other designers, engineers, and users and moving, uh, moving them, uh, the cards, uh, experimenting, experimenting with different ways of organizing your content. The format makes it really easy to quickly experiment with different structures and get it in, and get input from your team. Is it better if we group pages like this or like this? Would we need to point to item C from item A? And what is more important, this or this? Keeping yourself analog with literal cards and post-its and Sharpies allows for more flexibility during the planning phase. You'll find that once something is in a document or even just printed out, people are, are are a lot less likely to make drastic changes, even if it would be a good idea.